Um, you notice I have two titles, but that actually means about four times the, the work. Uh, I'm serving as the temporary meteorologist in charge after Fred Johnson, uh, the, the permanent official in charge, uh, uh, decided to leave us for East Central Florida, and he now serves to run the Melbourne, Florida office. Um, no word on when they're going to uh, have someone permanent, but the good news for me is that due to OPM rules, after 120 days, I have to uh, give up the title and send it to my science officer, Andy Devanis, who will serve for the next uh, four months, which means I get to do my regular job again at uh, attending talks and working with our emergency management partners. Uh, Linda gave me, uh, made me happy when we were talking about a presentation. She said, she said, you know, we really don't want to hear about hurricanes. And that's fantastic because everything I talk about, you know, roughly since April has been about hurricanes. So I'm very happy to talk a little bit about what's coming down the pike in the National Weather Service. Some new technology and software that's being planned to, uh, um, uh, to help improve our services to the community. And again, my normal job is a warning coordination meteorologist. I, I'm the outside guy in the office. In other words, my job is to work with the emergency management partners, uh, with, and as well as the first responders, uh, department heads, and as well as be the liaison to the, to the state in our services, making sure that everyone understands uh, what it is that we actually produce in uncertainties and different weather situations. And when we do deal with hazardous weather, we actually provide decision support service to, uh, to the community and so that they can make the best uh, decisions regarding whether it be evacuation or preparedness. And uh, the next event, obviously, that we're looking at is from Goombe over to uh, over through Fantasy Fest, and where I work with the uh, Key West emergency manager to look at any potential hazardous weather threats and make sure that they're very aware of, of those because there's a lot of sensitive issues, whether it be the height of a float, um, high tides sometimes can cause an issue uh, with parade routes uh, in downtown Key West. And our job is to take, take a look in advance and see what those threats might be and make sure that they have that best information uh, so that they conduct a very safe event. In fact, if everything goes well, uh, a lot of the revelers don't know that anything has been changed at all. And that's actually the, the best outcome. Us. Now, on the photographs on the screen there, um, I took some pictures uh, in the upper left-hand corner. That's our place in the airport uh, with the big round table in the middle. Um, in the upper middle there, that's the Spokane office, actually. Um, you can't ask for much different weather from the Florida Keys. Uh, I don't recommend moving there in February like I did. And then in the lower right, of course, our, our facility on White Street. And uh, the pictures there, if you notice it's very dark in the windows there, um, I am actually briefing Billy Wagner, actually, and that's during Hurricane Wilma. So that was actually the operation <coughs> the working there. Uh, the, just, a, uh, just a kind of rough rundown of the weather service. We have 122 weather forecast offices, uh, which actually provide weather warning and forecast services out to seven days. Uh, it includes facilities in Guam and in Puerto Rico. Uh, there are additional facilities, two tsunami warning centers. There are um, uh, actually a dozen or more center weather service units which support flight routing, uh, you know, support to the FAA, as well as a, a good 30 or so river forecast centers across the country. And then there, of course, there are national centers like the Hurricane Center, the Storm Prediction Center, Space Weather Center, actually. Uh, part of the National Weather Service function is to monitor the sun and look for disturbances, solar flares, et cetera, that might disrupt satellite communications. Uh, as well as communications for aircraft, uh, especially flying near the poles. Now, I'm going to start with old school and work to the, uh, toward new school. Old school is, obviously, we're in charge of collecting weather observations. And we do that not just uh, through the Weather Service, but through the National Ocean Service. Uh, platforms out on the uh, old lighthouses. Uh, believe it or not, some of the ones that, like the lower left there, that's Sand Key, have actually been abandoned actually. Uh, the structure is not safe to maintain anymore, so they installed a new sensor on a new platform that the Coast Guard uh, installed actually closer to the ship channel. And that unfortunately is a problem with dealing with the ocean. Uh, the elements are very harsh on the platforms, and so uh, eventually you need to find new locations to get wind and uh, water data. Uh, collecting observations ranges from automated systems, uh, which cost over $300,000 to install, uh, for instance at the airports as well as uh, uh, folks, especially at the state parks, which 
in the morning, uh, the radiators actually check high low temperature and the rainfall. So old school still works there as well. Um, weather balloons, we launch twice a day from our facility on White Street. Uh, there are over 90 uh, stations which launch uh, weather balloons across the country. And uh, they launch at the same time to get information to feed into all those forecast models you hear about. See, it's not enough to know what's going on on the surface. We need to know what's going on above our heads as well. And so these little instrument packages take readings, uh, you know, many times a second of temperature and humidity, and uh, they're tracked by GPS, so we can calculate wind speed as they go up. And uh, that information is very important uh, to know the position and strength of weather systems, both large and small. And uh, during times when you have tropical cyclones uh, nearby, we launch four times a day because the hurricane models are actually run once every six hours, and they need a full data set. Moving on, there we go. Satellites, we maintain two different kinds of systems. The GOES, or geostationary, that meaning that they rotate as the Earth rotates. So they appear fixed over a certain point. Those are the ones where you see all the satellite loops come from. In other words, as things are in motion, it's because it's like setting up a camera in one spot and watching the weather move underneath it. POSE, or polar orbiting satellites, are at a much lower altitude and they circulate from the North Pole to the South Pole, and the Earth rotates underneath it. Those provide information in the swaths, such as in the lower center there, you see the, the bright yellow, red, and green colors. And then it gets a, a sensor that monitors wind stress on the ocean. And you can use that to estimate wind speed over open ocean, where you don't need a buoy or a ship passing through it. And so this is remote sensing, and these systems, of course, are, are being maintained. Doppler radar, I believe or not, is 1988 technology. Uh, and uh, this has been the mainstay of our short-term warning system. This is the system that we depend on mostly for issuing severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And in the United States, we are fortunate to have an overlapping radar network, uh, which is what we've referred to before as the overlapping coastal century program, where the Miami radar is close enough that they can see over us and we can see over them. It's helpful because a lot of weather systems, such as hurricanes, can pass in between, where we need highly detailed information. And of course, for long-term sustainability, where you can perform long-term maintenance and still have coverage over your area. You know, a lot of other nations do not have overlapping coverage, or they, have, they face a lot of uh, blocks, like into mountains and otherwise. So we're very fortunate you know, to have a pretty robust network. There are actually about 160 radar units operated by the National Weather Service and formerly by the DOD as well. Oops. Okay. Um, one of the upgrades that we did just a few years ago was to change it to dual polarization. Now, if any of you have been in the military, dual polarization has been around for quite some time. And uh, basically, a signal is sent out, 90 degree angles to each other, and instead of just measuring the strength of the object that it bounces off of, you actually can get some idea of the size of the object. For our case, we had to wait so long because we're not looking at airplanes or ships. We're looking at very small you know, water droplets at great distances, at hundreds of miles away. And so this allows us to see what's going on within the cloud, whether or not a thunderstorm contains a lot of hail versus one that's supposed to contain the water droplets. And this leads to much better rainfall estimates. Across the country, it has been estimated uh, by the American Meteorological Society that there's a $690 million annual benefit to getting the river forecast more correct. And the only way we can do this is to have the, rate of the rainfall estimates from the dual polarization radars, which improves uh, you know, how, how much rainfall you know can fall over an area. Otherwise, you have to depend on gauges, which may be many, many miles apart from each other and won't capture some of the very intense rainfall that can occur, for instance, in mountain canyons and valleys, uh, and just from the nature of small thunderstorms. Um, it improves aviation forecasting a bit, too, because we know we can see ice and a relative level where it occurs within a large area of rain, or for instance, under a winter storm, and bird migration, which is continuously going on right now, where you see objects that are rain. See, the radar now can flag them directly as not being rain, when before it could not. We also depend on a volunteer network of storm spotters. We're training annually, it's about two and a half hours. We 
because we have an added section on marine spotting and water spots, which is a uh, most of the water spots we see over the water is a much different animal from uh, the tornadoes that you see over the Midwest. But of course, we cover uh, that part of violent weather as well. And of course, our cooperative observers, most of them are at state parks. We continue to maintain the NOAA All Hazards Radio System uh, in our Key West office. We actually broadcast directly to two transmitters, Sugarloaf Key and Tea Table Key. A couple years ago, Tea Table Key was upgraded uh, from a county-owned system that the Sheriff's Department maintained, um, all the way up to a weather service maintained 300 watt dual transmitter. And therefore, if the transmitter breaks, we can switch to the other one, and we've assumed the maintenance on there which means that we can control uh, you know, how fast the uh, repair can be. It's been a lot easier and more efficient to do it. Uh, the Princeton transmitter, which broadcasts into Key Largo and Ocean Reef, is operated by the weather office in Miami. Uh, now, now we're going to start getting into the new park. And uh, sometimes our old system we need to depend on. Our big one is going to be the service, uh, not live, it should be service life extension of the Doppler radar system. As I told you, it was designed in the 80s, and uh, many of them were deployed in the early half of the 1990s. And it's a mechanical radar. It spins on a chain drive system, diesel uh, uh, generator uh, backup on there. That's on three-phase electric power. And those things have been rotating. You know, basically most of them, you know, 99% or better of all that time since they were deployed, they need to be replaced. And uh, they're targeting between 2019 and 2022 for all 160 units. Um, obviously, computer boards have improved over time, so there's hardware that goes into the, the little service building. And then the little service building is like a shed. And like any other building, they're facing roof leaks and other you know, hazards and in the salt environment. Uh, we understand that more than anywhere else. And so all that has to be done. It's time to renovate the house. And the goal is to maintain, during that time, a 96% reliability. If we do not do this project on time, then the, the chance that you get more than six or seven radars out of service at a moment is going to go way up. And it's, this is actually preventative maintenance in the system. Some new part uh, of our forecast system are actually happening in-house. This is the nearshore wave prediction system. It's a high-resolution nearshore wave model that we're actually running in our office on a server and supported nationally. And, and uh, some of the routes that actually come from the US Navy, which, uh, which had developed an earlier uh, predecessor model called SWAN. And what's nice about this model is you can factor in the Gulf Stream into it. And when you have strong northeast winds, steepness and height of waves will start to show up a lot more clearly from the old um, you know, 10 kilometer uh, resolution models that we use uh, you know, over the entire ocean basin. And there's really, very rarely find a more complex sea environment than what you have in the Florida Keys with very narrow channels, the shallow bay, the shoaling that occurs way offshore on the Gulf side of the Keys, uh, which are the ferry the Key, uh, Fort Myers will constantly encounter, and of course deep water off the reef with a fast current flowing through it. And so this is run uh, daily out of our office, and the sea heights that come from it are being used, actually, in our daily marine forecast. This, uh, the HRRR, or High Resolution Rapid Refresh Model, is something that got some national attention <coughs> over the last week over the news. Um, it is run out of the Environment Modeling Center, uh, in other words, the National Weather Service component that runs the computer models on supercomputers. And this um, forecast, I actually snapped, uh, just took a little snapshot of the radar this morning in the upper left, and actually in the bottom there. Um, what's interesting about this is you're looking at a model that, that's domain is including the entire eastern half of the country at a uh, three kilometer resolution. And at 12 hour prediction, it's actually showing individual small cell form showers over the Florida <coughs> Straits at, a 12, at 12 hours. And uh, this model run actually came out at 10 p.m. This is useful, not in the sense of you're trying to get the shower in the right place. That science isn't there yet at that resolution. But what you want to get is the mode of the precipitation. Are you dealing with single cells, little showers, garden variety things, or are you looking at a small line? And this is where the value of that model is going to come in handy. Things like the uh, big small line that happened a couple years ago on the East Coast. It swept from Virginia all the way 
through the D.C. area and Pennsylvania. You know, things like that are going to stand out a lot better than the conventional models that we run out for three to seven days or so are going to be able to capture. And so it's very promising and it's part of the operational system now. So how did we run this model? Uh, basically the models are run out 14 hours from an initial time and they're sent every hour. Um, three kilometers on the ground and the time steps are every 15 minutes on there. So that's pretty impressive. And eventually as they, we improve our display systems, it'll be a lot easier to see how smoothly um, these predictions are. I will caution you, though, that there's a reason why there are human beings in forecast offices. You can't replace humans with a single model, because what if we have a problem with our balloon launch system and we didn't get that balloon up? Then that information just does not come into the model runs. And so in theory, for up to 12 hours, that information is missing. And as we say with models and many other types of systems, garbage in, garbage out. And so that's what the uh, value we provide. It's a tool. It's a great tool to have in our toolkit. I'm going to move on to a, a component of the Weather Service, and well, actually NOAA, actually, actually, correct. They are not actually a part of the Weather Service operations, but under NOAA, the National Severe Storms Lab in, the, in Norman, Oklahoma. And they're developing a wide range of systems uh, that will improve interaction with the public and emergency managers, all the way to the tools that we use. The first is on the kind of on the social media side is Enping, and basically they collected uh, the kind of the the guts of like four different tools that were being used to sample weather data from snow, hail, severe weather reports, and to get it into one place. And uh, <laughs> since the Weather Service is currently using uh, Macintosh systems and, and uh, apps as far as mobile hardware. Um, some of the applications that they were able to develop were actually available, you know, through the App Store out there, and I know as it was Google as well. And basically, it's a reporting system that, that is encouraging people to report weather where they are, and collected centrally so that it is able to be viewed by forecasters. Uh, when you think about it, a violent thunderstorm moves across, let's say, the greater Wichita area, and is dropping large hail it would be impossible for every storm spotter that they trained, and they might have thousands in, you know, over the decades of service to that community, that has a single 1-800 number to report. Obviously, that's not going to work. People like to report when they see something and do it immediately. And with geocoding, um, it's very easy to see where that location is at the time that they reported on there. So you can collect hundreds of reports in a very short distance. You know, period of time, and obviously it has applications for snowstorms and the like as well. And again, this is just a, a kind of crude representation is that the reports come in and they can be looped in real time and matched up to radar you know, signatures as well. Oops. Uh, one of the things that the Severe Storms Lab has developed is the Hazardous Weather Test Bed. It's actually a place that forecasters go not just to train, but actually to test new software and systems. This could be the developers themselves. Many of them come from the local weather offices, or they can be developed nationally by uh, one of our national contractors, such as Raytheon, and they need to test the human element of it. Here's a new tool, but you have to actually sit forecasters there and you know, plug and play and actually make sure it works in a severe environment. And what's something that we can't really do in our local office, but while we can assess individual performance, put, a, put someone on a standalone machine and run through three hours of severe weather uh, scenario, team training is very important. It's worked for NASA and it it's worked for the military for a long time, but in the weather service, it's really underutilized. And so now we have a place to send people to train on multiple systems, communicate with each other, and assess where, what we're doing right and what we need to improve on. One of the things that they are testing is something called the multi-radar multi-sensor system. Now, this looks like, you know, this is a, like a side view, a cross-section of what might look like a shower or thunderstorm in the area. But what I actually did, it comes up, is actually did a cross-section around the country. You see, all these 160 radars aren't necessarily linked in a vertical mosaic. Only when you look like, like you're looking down at the Earth we can do the national radar map, but what they're doing is taking, knowing where all the radar slices are coming from or all across the country, is coming up with actually like a four-dimensional package. 
In other words, you can loop it. You can actually see the structure of large weather systems, not just an individual storm or thunderstorm, because you happen to be sitting uh, in the same station as the radar. And so for this to be of any use, you have to mosaic and get this all together. And it's kind of a complex thing to do, since radars are at different heights and elevations, especially across the west, and all the slices don't necessarily match up nice and evenly. And uh, another thing that they can do is also cross-reference against what rain gauges are actually reporting and try to discover what parts of the radar network actually are showing a bias. Are they reading too low over a certain part of the country or, or too high? And that way we can make uh, algorithm corrections to the radar. Uh, and I don't even know how you pronounce that acronym, but it's called the Multi-Year Reanalysis of next rad Data. Well, we've been collecting all the data from these operating radars for you know, at least 15 years or not even more. And so let's take that data and start running a statistical analysis of it. Now, if you have a thunderstorm in the Florida Keys in July might have an inherent certain chance of becoming severe or not, producing water spouts, et cetera. And so it's about time we develop this kind of foundation and put it to operational use. Um, we can we'll now have a local storm climatology and this is important for the next step, which is to produce models, storm-based models, models that run with time steps of minutes to actually predict the evolution and lifetime of individual thunderstorms. To do that, you need to have a strong foundation in the statistics. Uh, and part of that's going to be in a major project to, they're targeting in 2019 called the FACETS, a continuum of environmental threats. You start with the nature of the threats in the areas that they occur, improve our observations and our guidance, improve the decision-making process of the weather forecaster, develop the tools to create products uh, that are effective for response. Uh, the days of sending a piece of text out through the weather wire or broadcasting a no weather radio are going to be long gone very shortly. People want to see pictures, they want to see more information and uh, to make better information. And of course, we need to develop a good verification system. Otherwise, you can send out any product. If you're not checking your work, you don't know if you're really doing something effective or not. Um, this is just an example of these are tools that we do not have in the office at present time, but hopefully in the next five years or so, uh, which will allow us to analyze storms, not just large weather systems, but to provide information and develop an interactive portal for the emergency managers so that they can ask questions, denote targets, you know, actually indicate certain areas of concern, and allow us to focus our uh, support activities to what needs to happen. This image here is actually from a model. We can actually model a thunderstorm, and that's actually being done by the Severe Storm Center, or well, Severe Storms Lab. With 2020 and beyond, we're gonna try to change the paradigm on how we issue warnings. You see, right now, we look at radar, and we analyze different uh, uh, thunderstorms for their ability to produce severe weather, and then we have to make a conscious decision to, answer, to issue a warning. What we need is model guidance that helps predict that evolution, so we know whether to, uh, you know, whether to spend our energy on one storm versus another one, and as well as look for the ones that could become tornadic. As I wrap up here, some of that's going to be uh, once is to develop these little swaths that show the relative percentage of that a storm might achieve a certain uh, severe threshold, as well as predict the possible track of tornadoes and or the rotation within the thunderstorm that produces them. This is actually a model prediction that you're seeing on the screen for one of the more recent, uh, I think that was the more uh, Oklahoma tornado. And so with overlaid with the actual track of the tornado itself in there, and you notice there's a kind of this kind of funny cone around the outside. So not just for hurricanes anymore, but we might be issuing actually threat cones on a very short time scale for severe storms. And we can also use it to look at outbreaks across the country, like uh, the recent one in uh, North Alabama. And the close-up of that, the areas in red on the left-hand side there are actually model prediction of the best location of a uh, of rotation in the thunderstorm over the next hour. That's a prediction. The little thin black lines you see were the actual location of the tornado. So in other words, looking at weather not as a uh, 
uh, not just about whether the chance of rain tomorrow, is actually using that same methodology and how we predict weather for the next five days in the short scale to, to give better information on severe storms and, that, and focus on folks that can actually uh, take an action to protect their life. The key in getting worn on forecast to work is phased array radar. No more moving parts. Uh, and that is a very, that is down the road. And, but that is going to provide us with full volume scans, 40 plus levels at 40 to 50 second intervals, where right now we have to wait about four, four minutes or so for a complete scan. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I know that there's a lot of information, but that's what we're looking at now for the next six to seven years, and to help better uh, protect our community here in the Florida Keys.